So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Endometriosis Action Month Wales event. We're just going to leave a few minutes now for people to, uh, to dial in and join before we get going. So this is actually the third, the, sorry, the fourth and final uh, parliamentary event that we do for Endometriosis Action Month. So we kicked off the beginning of the month with a Northern Ireland Assembly event. Um, the second, then the, on the 15th, we had a Scottish Parliament event. And on Tuesday this week, we had a Westminster event. So this is the, the fourth and final parliamentary event we're doing. They've all gone well. And like tonight, uh, we've got a great lineup of um, panelists. So I'm expecting this event to go well too. So we'll just leave it a few more minutes because it generally takes sort of three or four minutes for people to, you know, log in um, and join us. So just to let you know, the event is being recorded and we will put the recording, we will edit and then put the recording on our website um, a few days after the event so that if anyone wanted to attend and wasn't able to, they can watch the event. I see we still have people joining. So I'll leave it a little bit longer and then we'll get going. Okay, right, I think we'll, um, we'll get going now. So um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Endometriosis UK, a fair treatment for the women of Wales, Endometriosis Action Month event, Endometri Endometriosis Care in Wales, where are we now? And that's the question we're hoping to answer tonight. Um, I'm Rebecca Taylor, I'm the policy manager at Endometriosis UK. And just a few housekeeping, um, as I mentioned, uh, the event is being recorded, so we will um, edit it and put it on our website later. There is a Q&A function that attendees can use um, because there will be um, after we have the after the speakers have um, given their interventions, um, there will be time for questions. So we'll be asking um, people to put questions in the Q&A box. Um, please note that we won't be able to answer any questions that are to do with individual medical circumstances. Um, so um, yeah, please post questions about the talks and um, general questions. Um, and our experience at other events is that we never quite get through all the questions. We do our best, um, but what we will do is if there are some questions that were we're not able to answer, we will get back to them later and then publish something. So uh, let me introduce the speakers we have today. So we have um, Jenny Rathbone, who is the member of Senate for the constituency of Cardiff Central. Jenny was first elected in 2011 and then re-elected in 2016 and 2021. Jenny has been a long-term champion of women's health in the Senate and is chair of the cross-party group on women's health. She's also a great supporter of the endometriosis community and works with Endometriosis UK and Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Beth Hales lives in Cardiff and has endometriosis herself. Beth has shared her experiences of living with endometriosis in the media to raise awareness of the condition. Last year, Beth initiated a petition to the Senate Petitions Committee about improving endometriosis care in Wales and giving it the funding it needs. And she managed to get um, 
nearly is around 6,000 signatures on her petition and the petition was actually debated by the petitions committee in February and I'm sure that Beth will give us uh, some further information on that campaign when she speaks. Um, Debbie Sheffer is the founder of Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales, uh, a patient-led charity seeking to improve healthcare for women um, across Wales. Endometriosis is one of the areas that um, FTWW focus on and also um, a priority area for Debbie herself. And Debbie's going to speak about the impact of endometriosis on mental health, which is something of great importance to the endometriosis community that doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. And finally, Jenny Shaw is one of the new Health Board Endometriosis Specialist Nurses. Jenny began her nursing career in Leeds before moving to London and then down to Kent, where she was part of a team that um, established an endometriosis specialist centre at the NHS Trust where she was working. And Jenny's going to tell us a bit more about the new Health Board Endometriosis Nurse roles. And um, I'm Rebecca Taylor, the Policy Manager at Endometriosis UK. Um, I'm going to first start with, we did invite the Welsh Government to um, join the event. Unfortunately, they were not able to do that, but they did provide us with a few slides, which I'm going to present without comment because I'm not the Welsh Government. Um, but we'll just do that now. Let me share the slides. There we go. Is this coming up? I think I need to do a slideshow. There we go. Can everyone see the slides? Brilliant. So this is just an update that we got from um, Jonathan Williams, the head of Women and Children's Health in the Welsh Government, who unfortunately was not able to attend tonight, but he was very keen on providing us with an update. So um, just to give a bit of background, the Women's Health Implementation Group uh, was established in 2018, looking at a number of specific women's health areas, including endometriosis. And it was supported by, um, it's supported by um, funding from the government. The current chair is Carol Shillibeer, who is the CEO of the Powys Teaching Health Board. An activity that the Women's Health Implementation Group has done so far, um, funding has allowed for the appointment of pelvic um, and well-being coordinators for each health board and more recently as we've seen the appointment of um, endometriosis nurses for each health board and the purpose of these roles is to support women awaiting treatment and signpost to to other support services um, next steps um, as you may have heard um, there's going to be the health minister uh, confirmed recently that there will be um, development of a women's health quality statement, which will be what the government expects health boards to uh, meet and also the development of a women's health plan, which is more aimed at the public and that will lay out what the government hopes to achieve. Um, in terms of healthcare for women and it will adopt um, a life course approach. Um, the principle set out in Better for Women, which was published by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So there we go. That is just a little update that um, I will stop the sharing now that we received um, from the Welsh Government just to remind people of the things that they have been doing recently. And I think most of you will have seen um, the announcement um, on International Women's Day of the um, endometriosis specialist nurses for the health board. And of course, we have one of those nurses here tonight. So without further ado, I will pass over to um, Jenny Rathbone, who's going to give her view from the Senate. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, be with you today uh, to discuss uh, a subject that affects uh, one in 10 women. Um, and it's been quite a journey for me to understand why it is that something that's so uh, common amongst women 
as yet uh, so poorly understood. And I think it's uh, possibly is uh, a, a good illustration of how um, health services, along with many other services, uh, tend to be um, discriminate against women uh, in, in um, without um, meaning to do so. You know that it's just part of the the general bias um, in our society, which where men are the dominant. Um, the women's health group uh, was started in. Uh, at the back end of, of 2018 um, with the support of the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. And initially it started as, a, as an abortion group, um, but it, it quickly uh, metamorphosed into a, a wider discussion about um, issues affecting women um, health-wise. Um, and uh, one of our most important discussions was um, a tripartite look at um presentations on endometriosis first of all from um fair treatment for the women of wales uh, including debbie schaefer who's going to speak to you uh, later uh, from um one of the consultants uh, endometriosis specialists who work um in cardiff and the vale health board providing the only endometriosis secondary and tertiary care service in Wales uh, for the time being, um, and also from the, the Women's Health Information Group, which um, uh, Rebecca's already um, shared slides from, from the Welsh Government. Uh, and that, um, that Women's Health um, Implementation Group still exists, um, and it's still doing work on endometriosis and one other subject. So. Um, that is a clear indication that this is a work in progress and there's still plenty uh, to be done on this. I think one of the achievements that arose out of a, an independent members uh, cross party debate that occurred in November 2020, where we had a particularly powerful contribution from um, a then member of the Senate called Susie Davis, a wonderful conservative, and by the way, I'm a Labour member, um, you know, her contribution was just so powerful and um, plenty of other people said that this was a very powerful debate, but it was her contribution that was outstanding um, because she was prepared to share just how much she personally had suffered as a result of this. And there are other members who've got close family members who've got endometriosis. So the, there is a certain amount of uh, experience of the the condition uh, amongst female members particularly. Um, I, so I think arising out of that awareness, one of the important things that happened was that Susie Davis introduced a clause into the new curriculum act, uh, which said that not only would um, pupils be having relationship and sexuality education, but that uh, it would include, you know, in the act is menstrual education for both young girls and boys so that everybody is aware what a normal period is like uh, and that is compulsory all students are involved um, it enables uh, the, uh, young people to realize that perhaps what they are experiencing is not normal so, uh, and one of the other achievements of, uh, of the, the work that's been done by the Welsh Government is, of course, the appointment of endometriosis specialist nurse in every health board. Uh, and their primary role, in my view, is going to be to educate our general practitioners and our gynaecologists, as well as all the other people in the primary care team, to understand uh, just how um, big an issue endometriosis is, so that people aren't suffering in silence for, for years and years and being told to go away that there's nothing wrong. Um, so that is a massive issue, but there are many others as well, which I'm very happy to have a discussion with um, after we've um, heard from the other people. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, it's now time for me to speak. So um, you may not be surprised to hear that one of the um, biggest issue that we hear uh, from the endometrial community in Wales 
is a uh, concern about waiting times, waiting times for gynecology appointments and particularly for surgery uh, when it's needed at an endometriosis specialist center. And we know from the 2020 APPG inquiry that waiting times before the pandemic were a bit longer in Wales than, than other parts of the UK. So for example, um, around 44% of uh, women in Wales got a gynecology appointment within six months compared to 69% the UK as a whole. And in terms of surgery, um, just over half got surgery within six months compared to 70% to the UK as a whole. And that was pre-pandemic. So there were some issues pre-pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic has made all those things worse for everybody um, or across the UK, not, not unique to Wales. And um, our COVID impact survey last year um, looked at this. So we asked um, those with endometriosis across the UK to fill in the survey and sort of what impact did COVID had on you, you know, getting the healthcare you need and on waiting times when somebody's um, appointments were postponed or cancelled. And we found some some differences there some were pretty the same with the rest of the uk but we found um, some differences and in particular when we asked people um you know about having appointments postponed or cancelled how long did it take you to get a new date and this was the survey was done in july or august last year when people uh, completed the survey and we had a much higher um, percentage of people in wales saying that they still had no date and they hadn't heard anything and that was that was um around 50 percent for postponed and cancelled appointments, whereas it was a little bit lower, it was more like 30% um, in the survey as a whole. So there were some differences showing up there. And obviously there are two um, BSGE, the, the Endometriosis Specialist Centres in Wales, one fully accredited centre in Cardiff and a provisional centre in uh, Swansea. And for those needing specialist care in North Wales, they're actually much nearer to specialist centres on the NHS in Merseyside. And although arrangements exist for those cross-border referrals, we know that they, they don't always happen. And access to specialist care in Wales is not helped by the funding situation. Firstly, the block funding mechanisms don't reflect the complexity of specialist care. And secondly, because the funding doesn't follow the patient from health board to health board, and there are obviously only two health boards in Wales that have specialists um, that offer the specialist care, it means that in some cases, complex cases are essentially referred to a special centre with unfunded, uh, which isn't very isn't really fair on the centre receiving the patients, and it's no good for the patients either. So um, you're probably aware that there's um, a coalition of charities that came together to um, develop a quality statement on women's health in Wales. And this was led by Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales and uh, the British Heart Foundation Cymru. And Endometriosis UK was uh, one of the charities involved in that. And one of the things that that coalition is asking for is that specialist care for endometriosis comes under the Welsh Health Specialist Services Committee. Not all the care, but just the, the specialist care, because then you will, there's a funding mechanism there that already exists that works, for example, for rare cancers. So um, we hope the Welsh Government will take up this suggestion, <laughs> um, because solving that funding issue, I think, is a crucial step in improving the access to specialist care. And obviously, uh, there was earlier, this is something that the Senate is looking at at the moment, because there was a consultation on waiting times, and we provided the Senate with our response. We also provided them with um, data from Welsh respondents in the COVID impact survey, which isn't made public because some of the numbers answering those questions are really low. So it has to be taken very carefully. So it was provided to the Senate, but not, um, not all of it was published. Some of it's in our response. And we very much hope that, you know, the, the consultation will strengthen the case for more investment in tackling the, gyneco the gynecology backlog in Wales. So let's see what happens. We don't know yet. And um, as part of Endometriosis Action Month, we have just, as in yesterday, <laughs> um, launched a Right to Your MP campaign to improve endometriosis care. So. Um, this is what we're asking for is that the NICE guideline, which is the national guidance on endometriosis care, which is adopted everywhere in the UK, including in Wales, is uh, reviewed and updated. So there's a number of reasons for asking this. Firstly, there are gaps 
in the guideline, particularly around pain management, which is only covered very briefly. Endometriosis outside the pelvic area, like thoracic, where you get it on the lungs or the, the diaphragm, isn't covered at all. And mental health um, is not covered, which is very important, as Debbie will explain later. And what we did is we've got um, the chairs of the APPG in Westminster to table what's called an early day motion. And we're asking uh, Westminster MPs to sign it. So it's just a way to put pressure on the government because it's actually the UK Department of Health in Westminster who can ask NICE to update the guidelines. So we're doing it like that. So um, we're asking people to write to their um, MP um, to ask them to sign the early day motion. And we are also asking people to write to their Senate members to ask them to support Endometriosis Action Month. And all the information is on our website. And I'll also send up a follow up email to all attendees uh, tomorrow. So join our campaign. <laughs> Let's see if we can get the NICE guideline updated. That would be great. And of course, then we'll be asking the Welsh Government to adopt it and implement it. Um, so that's my update. And I will now um, pass over to Beth, who will give the view from the endometriosis community and also her own experiences. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Beth. I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2015, um, and I'm also a campaigner for the improvement of endo healthcare here in Wales. Um, like most of us, I was just told as a teenager that periods can be painful and it was just something that you had to get on with um, and was put on the pill to help with symptoms that I was suffering with. It wasn't until my husband and I started trying for a family and we discovered we were having fertility issues that um, I even heard about endometriosis. Um, that was when I was 30. Um, and uh, we were told we would need IVF. Um, but that was when they hadn't, uh, I hadn't actually had my endo diagnosis. Um, and so I insisted um, with my GP at having a referral to a gynaecologist because I couldn't understand how treatment could be recommended without um, a diagnosis first. Um, thankfully, the gynaecologist that I was referred to was Anthony Griffiths, who's one of the two specialists here in Wales. And thanks to him and to speaking up with my GP, we thankfully were able to have our two daughters. Unfortunately, my symptoms returned a couple of years ago, um, but although I've got a diagnosis of endometriosis now on my medical records, I was back to square one with the GP um, being dismissed. Um, they thought my symptoms were down to anxiety and stress, and it took a lot of back and forth um, and insisting um, on getting a referral back to gynaecology to be seen. Um, I did end up having to have another laparoscopy with um, Anthony Griffiths and he said to me that all the symptoms you've been saying to your GP about are all classic endo symptoms um, and I wouldn't wish having endo on anyone but I was just so relieved when he confirmed after the laparoscopy that that's what it was because I thought I was going mad um, being told that that wasn't what it was and it was down to other issues. Um, this ongoing battle is so common um, for all endo patients. You hear stories similar to this every day and sometimes a lot, lot worse than mine within the endo community. Um, long diagnosis times and wait lists, battling with symptoms, battling to be heard um, and battling to keep your sanity because of the huge impact endo can have on your everyday life. Um, I also realised that if one of my daughters grow up to have this disease, they will also have exactly the same challenges because things aren't improving at the moment. And that wouldn't be the case if they were boys. Um, I thought this inequality can't go unchallenged for another generation. So that's why I decided to set up the petition calling for the improvement of endo healthcare in Wales. Um, we've got the longest diagnostic delay of all the home nations. We've got two endo specialists when we should have a minimum of six to level up with the provision in Scotland and England. Um, and we're seeing so many patients now just being advised that they, they need to seek private health care. And, and that is not always an option for people. Um, and people shouldn't have to get themselves into debt or crowdfund or sell properties or even go abroad to access more affordable treatment. Um, 
hearing all these stories and realising how big a problem we are faced with, I started speaking up, even though I never used to speak about endometriosis, um, because I think it's so crucial that we all do to help raise awareness, especially as this is such an invisible disease. It's entwined with period taboos that just don't get spoken about. Um, and so I hope that the petition gave us a tangible way of highlighting this with policy makers and brought all the hard work been done by charities like FTWW, like Susie Davis, um, MS, you know, back onto the agenda, especially as we now look to recover from the pandemic. Um, as part of my campaigning, I've also raised the issue with the Minister of Social Justice, because I don't believe this is just a women's health issue. Um, girls are missing out on education whilst they can wait up to nine years for diagnosis. Women aren't able to progress their careers whilst waiting up to seven years for treatment. And some patients just can't access the specialist treatment they desperately need just because of where in Wales they live. I mean, it's 2022, we're 52% of the population, but we still don't have access to healthcare that's of equal standard to men. Um, and that's creating so many blockades in so many aspects of our lives. Um, and that definitely makes this a social justice issue and one that urgently needs to be addressed. Um, finally, I just wanted to pass on a message from my eldest daughter. So I hadn't have heard of endometriosis till I was, was 30 when I got my diagnosis. She's six in a couple of weeks. She can say it, she's got an understanding of what it is, and she's realised it's something that could affect her when she's older. Um, but I reassure her that it will be different for her and her sister because of everyone who is working so hard now to fight for change. Um, and so anyway, she just wanted me to thank everyone on this call today, whether you're speaking up and raising awareness and bravely sharing your story, whether you're one of our amazing NHS staff um, directly helping endo patients every day, or whether you're working with Welsh Government, within Welsh Government to help make policy changes that are so urgently needed. Um, everyone's voices are so important. And I think that we are now becoming loud enough um, for her generation to hopefully grow up in a more fair and equal Wales. So thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, we'll now move to um, Debbie, Debbie Schaffer from um, Fair Treatment for Women of Wales, who's going to speak about the impact of endometriosis on mental health. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, just to say that um, for those who are unfamiliar with the organisation Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales, we are an entirely patient-led uh, women's health equality charity supporting and advocating for um, women and people assigned female at birth who are disabled and or living with long-term health conditions of which endometriosis is just one. Um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity this evening to talk a little bit about the mental health impact of living with endometriosis, because it's something that comes up a great deal in the chronic illness community. Um, many people who are living with gynecological symptoms um, often find themselves not able to discuss them openly, which results in long diagnostic delays. And equally, um, women often describe themselves as either being disbelieved or subjected to unhelpful gender stereotypes, such as being weak or melodramatic. So um, with all of that in mind, I wanted to touch upon four key issues when discussing endometriosis and mental health. Uh, and the first one is just to say that FTWW is fully um, supportive of Endo UK's campaign to see NICE update its endometriosis guidance to include mental health support. And I just want to emphasize that that is not because we also believe those unhelpful gender stereotypes or that sufferers' symptoms are all in their head. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, we believe that mental health support is, is absolutely vital because it can help people find ways to, to cope with the psychological impact of living with a chronic physical illness. Um, and I don't want to sound too negative, um, but I think it's important to reflect the reality of what so many endometriosis patients um, are telling us about their symptoms. Um, and they include severe, 
long lasting pain, sometimes organ dysfunction, fatigue, and sometimes infertility. And, and all of these things can have a hugely significant impact on people's lives and functioning, such as their education, their job prospects, their financial security, their social lives and their relationships. So many people living with endometriosis tell us that they feel isolated and that they are struggling. So mental health support for us is a key part of a package of care for endo patients, which, which might well include pain management, pelvic physiotherapy and surgery if appropriate. All of these things can be really beneficial in equipping people to better manage both their symptoms and their circumstances. Uh, the second issue I wanted to cover really briefly is the Wales context. And just recently, the Senate's Health and Social Care Committee announced that mental health was going to be one of its top priorities um, for this term. Uh, we were really pleased to be able to host a focus group for the committee with our members um, who highlighted a number of particular concerns. Most especially, they talked about the mental health impact of not being believed or taken seriously whether by family, friends, or, or even sometimes their doctors. Um, our members describe the huge toll that this can take on their confidence and their self-belief, and how in many instances, the struggle, the long struggle to get a diagnosis and access to treatment can actually cause them um, to develop anxiety and depression. Um, and interestingly, just this week, uh, the Guardian newspaper uh, cited research that showed that more women were being prescribed anti-anxiety medication than ever before. And one of the reasons that was given for this was that women are more comfortable seeking support for mental health issues. But I think as endometriosis patients, we'd probably argue that there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, we believe that it's vital that all healthcare professionals are adequately supported and enabled to spot endometriosis symptoms as quickly as possible so that the impact on patients' mental health is reduced. The third topic I, I really quickly wanted to cover, um, which you've already mentioned, Rebecca, but is, is FTWW and Endo UK's involvement in a women and girls health plan for Wales. Uh, and we've already heard or seen updates from the Welsh Government, um, which convey the Health Minister's commitment to this. And I'm really pleased to say that the recommendations our organisations have put forward um, demonstrate the need for women's health to be seen holistically, with physical and mental health equitable parts of a woman's life, both of which require investment from our NHS. Uh, and my last key point, which ties in uh, very nicely with the theme of investment in better holistic care for endo patients, is, is around the recruitment of the endometriosis nurses for every health board in Wales. Um, FTWW's volunteers were involved in a fantastic two-day training event for them just last week. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that, that the nurses were left in no doubt about the vital role they will play in supporting patients to, to manage their symptoms, not least their mental well-being. Uh, and I think that leaves me now in a good position to uh, hopefully pass on to one of those endometriosis nurses. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thanks for that, Debbie. And indeed, uh, we are now passing on to Jenny Shaw, who is one of the new health board nurses um, based at the uh, Swansea Bay Health Board. And I will share Jenny's slides. If you can, can you share them yourself, Jenny? Is it letting you? No, I'm disabled okay. from sharing. Ah, I think that might be, I've solved it now. Ah, so I try again. Ah, yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. Lovely, lovely. Right, started with the end slide. Hmm. Slight technical hitch, sorry. <laughs> Let's just flick back through the slides. Okie dokie. Thank you ever so much, Rebecca, and thank you, Debbie, because um, without you, as I'm going to say in a second, I wouldn't be here. So, as I said, my name's Jenny Shaw. I work at Swansea Bay Health Board. 
Um, I am originally from England, as you can probably tell. I arrived in Swansea last summer and I'm part of a really fantastic group of nurses. Now, when my job was advertised, um, I did a little bit of research about endometriosis care in Wales. And I, again, have to thank Debbie. And I know Beth, this is a newer, I wasn't, you hadn't done this particular piece of work at that time, but this slide I think is really important. And it shows both the commitment but also the strength of the women of Wales um, in wanting to improve uh, the conditions and the care that they're receiving for endometriosis. So hopefully women have got a little bit, those listening, got a little bit of an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and as I say, in, in particular, I am very thankful to the members of the Task and Finish group and to Fair Treatment for Women in Wales in particular, without whom I wouldn't be here and neither would any of my colleagues. And it was one of the recommendations of the group that a nurse specialist, and I think this was 2018, if I remember rightly, yeah, um, that nurse should be appointed immediately for every health board. Well, I have discovered that things do go a little bit slower in Wales than generally in the, um, in, well, in England. Um, but I think the fact that that's only happened now this year is partly down to COVID, but partly also down to it just takes time to get things done here in Wales. But I'm really pleased to say that there is now at least one um, endometriosis nurse in every health board, Cardiff, Cardiff and Bale and the North Wales Health Board, whose name I'm sorry I cannot pronounce, um, <laughs> have two, they share. And this is a picture um, that Rebecca alluded to a few weeks ago. We met the health minister and the chief nursing officer for Wales in uh, Cardiff. And this was seven of us. Unfortunately, our colleagues from North Wales couldn't join us on this occasion. But you know what? It's a really exciting time to be an endometriosis nurse here in Wales. We are joining together as a group to become, as Liz put it the other day, a force to be reckoned with. And I think we will become a force to be reckoned with. Um, and in particular, we, um, and um, Debbie, you just mentioned the two day training event that we ha had in Cardiff last week. And it was the first opportunity for all nine of us to get together and meet and, <clears throat> do a bit of learning and also a bit of networking and it was a fantastic couple of days and credit for that has to go to the original endometriosis nurse in Wales and that's Liz Bruin. Um, her and her, her team in Cardiff put on a fantastic event and we were really lucky to meet the health minister again, she dropped in for a short time on the Thursday. But most importantly, and again, Debbie stole my thunder on this one, we met the most important people here, and those were the women of Wales. And some attended in person, many attended by Zoom, were kind enough to tell us their stories and probably are quite fed up of telling their stories. But they helped us to learn how to do history taking, talking about investigations and things that they might need and just giving us a full picture of what it's like to live with endometriosis in this time in Wales. And so from that, they gave us some very clear pointers of what they wanted our role to be. And ultimately, the most important thing they wanted to say to us is, we need someone to listen to us. We need to be heard. Our voices have been too quiet for too long. They've been dismissed. We've been disbelieved. We as nurses can provide a continuity of care, which I, they were, women were very keen that we were um, sort of a linchpin for them. And if you like, I call myself a middle woman quite often. So I can be the go between between the medical staff and the woman themselves and help with communication that way. Bottom right there, I'm going to stress this one because time and time again, we were told of 
the dismissive and frankly quite ignorant attitudes of some healthcare professionals towards these women and the fact that they had to highlight to us that what they needed was empathetic communication is really incredibly sad. Um, for us to advocate for them and to help them to learn to advocate for themselves and obviously organizations like FTWW are fantastic at that as well. Raising awareness and this goes back to Jenny's theme about improving the education of Yes, even gynaecologists within health boards, GPs, other healthcare professionals who quite often still do not understand what endometriosis is and the impact it can have on women. A key part of our role is working within the primary care sector and all of us, well, one of our um, colleagues who works in Powys, Amanda, She's actually based in primary care because they don't actually have secondary care facilities within Powys. So she's sort of on the flip side to us, but still is finding that probably the most challenging part of the role at the moment, but we're working on it. Um, helping women to better manage their symptoms. Here in Swansea Bay, we've started a new service jointly between a women's health physio and myself helping women to learn a little bit more about why they experience the symptoms that they've got and how best to manage them. And that's seeing really good results. And as Rebecca said at the beginning, the most important issue for the women was transparency around waiting times. This is quite a secret really across Wales in some ways. Some health boards are not telling women how long they're going to be waiting for surgery and women were quite clear they'd rather know the truth and know what they were dealing with. The two thought bubble um, uh, points that I've mentioned on here are really from the nurses, um, how we can improve access to NHS care for women with endometriosis which frankly to me, it feels like is going the way of NHS dentistry in Wales. You know, you really have to fight to get it. Um, and the other point really I need to make is that there is so much that needs improving. We as nurses cannot do it on our own. We need the support of our medical colleagues, the health board ma our management um, and all of the organizations out there. And of course, one of my biggest roles and our biggest roles as nurses is signposting. And on here, obviously, are some of the websites that I'm able to signpost to, including our local support group, the fantastic FTWW site, and the new and not very well recognized yet Endometriosis Cymru website. Um, and it, just as an example, in Swansea Bay, there was no web page on our intranet for women's health and gynaecology. That page that you can see there is only in draft form at the moment. It's been created by myself since I've got here. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that, Jenny. Um, I think a lot of uh, women in Wales are very interested in the new endometriosis um, health board roles um, and actually one of the first questions we've got is about those roles so I think I'll ask that to Jenny and someone says how do I get in contact with the endometriosis nurse in my area so obviously you can answer that very well for yourself um, but I don't know if there are standard procedures set up or so there is going to be, currently, because some of my colleagues have only come in to post in the past couple of months, I've been here since last summer, but I was an endometriosis nurse before I came here, and so I could sort of hit the ground running, although I had to find my way around the Welsh health system, which is a bit tricky. Um, but some of my colleagues are new into post and new to the role, and so it is going to take them a little bit of time Eventually, that website that I just showed, event, um, Endometriosis Cymru, is going to have contact details for all the endometriosis nurses across Wales. So 
at, at the moment, um, it may be that nurses aren't in, it depends what area the person's in, but it may be that the nurses aren't taking um, direct referrals or questions, but you could always just try ringing the, the hospital switchboard and asking if it's possible to speak to the endometriosis nurse because every health board has one. Okay, sure. thank you. And another question again for Jenny, I thought there'd be a few. Um, do all the endometriosis nurses have a background in gynecology? Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's fairly fundamental, really. Um, my colleague in Powys has a background more in primary care, but also in gynecology because she is a sex, sexual health trained and also family planning trained. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, the short answer is yes. Okay, brilliant. And next question, which um, may be to Jenny or possibly um, Debbie might know the answer. Um, the pelvic health and wellbeing coordinators, this was in the slides I presented on behalf of the Welsh Government. Um, is it possible to clarify what these coordinators do and how to contact them? I don't know if Debbie or Jenny is able to answer that question. I'm, I'm happy to take that one as well as I work quite closely with a pelvic Brilliant. health. Brilliant. They are, <laughs> they are prim primarily um, for women with mesh related issues. So the treatment for stress incontinence that was used and caused some problems. Um, and again, those nurses can usually be contacted through the hospital switchboard if you needed to get in contact with them. I can add a little bit there, Rebecca, if that would be helpful. Um, yeah, so just to, just to echo what Jenny was saying there, which is that the pelvic health uh, and wellbeing coordinators were originally designed to focus upon um, mesh and incontinence. But it's also really important, we believe, as patients, that um, there is sufficient provision to deal with pelvic pain as well, because we know that pelvic physiotherapy can actually be really helpful in, in managing some as aspects of pelvic pain. Uh, certainly for those patients who've had repeated um, operations, um, some of them have had hysterectomy, so they may well have quite a lot of scar tissue. Um, you know, so that pelvic physiotherapy is a good potentially, you know, non-invasive way of helping patients to, to better manage those symptoms as well. Thanks, Rebecca. And I'd just add to that one that pelvic um, floor physiotherapy is also very cost effective. You know, so it's something that I would stress that, and I have to the Welsh Minister already, stress that, that the, the sort of next way that I would like to see the initiative going. Um, I have a question now for Jenny Rathbone, uh, may have some um, input on this. In relation to solving the funding issue, what do you think we as campaigners need to do um, to sort of move this further? I mean, obviously, it's, it's in the, um, the quality statement that the charities have put together and we're suggesting that. I just wondered what um, kind of what, what you think would be the anything else that we, we you would think we need to do from the view of um, from the view of the Senate uh, I, I, it's a really complicated issue and one that the previous health health minister didn't want to address um, Elinid Morgan our current health minister is a very courageous woman and uh, if we need to uh, completely, uh, revisit the funding formula of uh, one in one out uh, so that the person who um, if I break my leg in Tembe uh, that's one incident and then somebody is sent across to Cardiff for an eight-hour operation involving four surgeons that's counted in the same framework and clearly that is completely unmanageable and Cardiff and the Vale have been subsidizing the care of other women uh, for a very long time and that is not a sustainable solution at all. 
So uh, the part of the solution to this is to try and grow secondary care expertise in other health boards, you know, given that, that there must be a sizable chunk of, of women in each area uh, of Wales who are going to need surgery. And therefore we need that surgery uh, if it's uh, to be, uh, there needs to be people who have the capacity and are trained up to be able to do that surgery in their local um, secondary care hospital. Um, and that is, I'm afraid, one of the casualties of COVID because so many things have been delayed as a result of COVID, including, you know, the, the backup of waiting lists um, that the Cardiff team had and the unfortunate um, coincidence that uh, one of the consultants has retired recently, as he's absolutely entitled to do, but he's yet to be replaced. And I don't know whether that's because they're having difficulty recruiting the right sort of person or whether um, they simply haven't had time to do it. Um, it but it clearly, it's something that is has to be on the agenda of, of the new chief executive of Cardiff and the Vale. So I, I tried to interest the chair of the um, Health and Social Care Committee in this issue of funding, and I could see that he wasn't interested. But we have to keep going on this one because there has to be a different mechanism for doing this um, because the current one uh, doesn't work. But I was interested in talking to you earlier that it doesn't, the way that the, the money follows the patient in England doesn't seem to have resolved the problems there. So it is not, you know, it's not the, the be all and the end all, but it, it clearly, certainly the tertiary service needs to be funded separately, um, you know, top, top sliced um, from the health budget because it can't possibly be just the duty of one health board to do it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the issue in England is like everywhere in the UK except Scotland is they there's been no attempt to measure the need for tertiary care and make sure it aligns with the centres that exist. So it, there's a mismatch there sometimes. Some areas are, are great and some less so. Um, there's only Scotland, in the only country in the UK that has actually worked out how much tertiary care they need and then aligned the capacity of the centres to match it. So there's something that we ask for, we ask, we're asking for in the women's health strategy in England, you know, measure the need and make sure it matches because a lot of the specialist centres in England were set up by clinicians with an interest. And there's also a risk, there's also a sustainability issue there that if those clinicians then retire or move on, maybe that centre, you know, doesn't, doesn't function anymore. So, yeah, so it, in England, it's a bit of what is classic postcode lottery. Um, that where there are, you know, good tertiary centres that have decent capacity, you know, the situation is better. But yeah, still not solved. Mm -hmm. Still not solved. Um, and we're also, uh, we've asked um, the Welsh Government to do the same to measure, um, measure the need and make sure that the capacity aligns with it. It's what we need to do everywhere, really. Um, I've had another question that will go to uh, Jenny Shaw, um, and that's um, those who have suspected endometriosis, so they haven't had a diagnosis yet, are they able to, um, to get assistance from the endometriosis specialist nurses and how would they go about that? Um, he, okay, so at the moment, if they have been referred into the service, then yes. But remember I said that all of myself and my colleagues are going to be expanding into primary care. That is going to take a little bit of time. And I know, I know that this is all taken time already. Um, you know, believe me, we're as impatient as anybody to, to get things moving, but it's just, uh, it's just, I mean, I, I've been trying for seven months to get in to meet with my primary care colleagues here in Swansea. So it just seems to be taking a little bit of time. So ultimately, the answer to that is going to be yes in the long term, maybe not quite so easy in the short term. But certainly, that is something that we see as very important.
Jenny, you had Jenny Rathbone. Sorry, it's confusing having two Jennies. Um, <laughs> Jenny Rathbone, you had a comment there. Yes. Um, I, I, I want to uh, turn this around a bit because it isn't, uh, it is a part of the crucial role of the end, endometriosis specialist nurses to train up the GPs and the gynecologist and all the other people in the primary care team to be able to spot uh, endometriosis because it simply isn't possible for one individual and in a health board to carry this burden of responsibility. We have just got to get better at this. It's completely unacceptable that it takes 26 GP appointments and eight and a half years to be get to referred to a specialist. So I think education of the primary care teams is has to be your top priority. And if it's taken you seven months to even get to see them, then that is a complete red flag for me. Uh, and uh, clearly it's something that I can discuss with the health minister. But I suppose my question to Jenny Shaw is, how are you going to manage to get on with training doctors, i.e. GPs and, um, and gynecologists on what they already ought to know, uh, given the, the general uh, bias uh, in favor of doctors over nurses? Yeah, I think I think uh, well, I've been a nurse for a very long time. Um, some of my colleagues, not quite as long. But, you know, GPs can only know so much about so many things. And they have a broad, broad spectrum of um, disorders that they need to know about. So I, I quite often take that tack you know, you're forgiven for, well, I mean, so one good, really good example, Jenny, is I was teaching medical students yesterday and they've just come into the end of their obs and gynae placement. And during that obs and gynae placement, one of those medical students had spent a total of two days in gynecology and the rest was in obstetrics. They were asked to do case studies and every single topic that they were given for case studies was on obstetrics. And we now know that GP trainees don't have to undertake gynecology placement during their training, which is shocking really, but that is the way it is. And so my tack is, you can be forgiven for not knowing this, but I'd like you to just, I'd like to give you a refresher and this is, these are the latest advances. And this is where we are and what we're doing now. That sort of way. And that tends to go down pretty well. Okay, Debbie, you had a, you wanted to say something? Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, no, it was just an answer to that, the, the previous question um, about um, those people with suspected endometriosis and you know, would they be able to access um, their endometriosis nurse? I think it comes back to Jenny Rathbone's um, earlier comment about the need to grow local expertise um, in, in secondary care within gynaecology. Um, so many patients um, will have a diagnostic laparoscopy, which comes back um, negative, for want of a better phrase. Um, and they can often have a few of those um, before endometriosis is finally identified, potentially by um, somebody more specialised. So there really is a need to improve the, the training that's taking place there so that we're, we have gynaecologists who are better equipped uh, to visually identify endometriosis when they do a diagnostic um, laparoscopy. Um, in terms of patients with suspected endo going to the GP, um, I think we'd probably urge them to have a look at the symptom tracker on um, endometriosis Cymru, which um, we very much hope will, will expedite referrals into gynaecology. And then hopefully then that will link in with improved expertise in those departments. So definitely something worth having a look at. Thanks, Rebecca. A comment from um, from uh, Liz Brune, who is the endometriosis nurse mentioned um, in uh, Jenny Shaw's uh, presentation, uh, noting that raising awareness in endometriosis and successful um, management is very much dependent on pathways and 
being involved with GK, GP training and education updates. That's just a comment from Liz there. Thank you, Liz. Um, and there's a couple of other questions here, one for Debbie and Jenny, which is what can patients do to get the best out of their GP and hospital appointments? I know from an endometriosis UK perspective, we often advise using a pain and symptoms diary because it can be difficult to recall everything um, accurately when you're sat in front of a GP for seven minutes. Um, but I'm sure Debbie and Jenny have many other suggestions. <laughs> Uh, well, Debbie has mentioned, just mentioned the symptom tracker on endometrius Cymru, which is absolutely fantastic and will give you, doctors quite like data and they quite like evidence. And if you can go along with data and evidence, you'll provide a bit more of a convincing case. Not that you should have to be convincing, but um, Persistence, I think, is what I would um, also say. Unfortunately, if you find the doctor you're talking to just doesn't look like they're interested or is not taking, you know, um, taking you seriously enough, go back and find another one. You know, most practices have more than one GP. And it would be really nice if we could identify GPs with an interest in gynecology. Apparently, there is no lead. Um, GP for gynaecology in Swansea, which personally I've, I mean, I found that quite shocking, really. So, um, you know, maybe if we can set up a network of GPs who do have an interest and then they can be going back to their colleagues and, you know, saying this is what's happening in endometriosis care and this is what we need to be doing, maybe that's also a way in. Yeah. Um, I would just mention here that in Scotland, under the Women's Health Plan, they have done something on that so that every primary care practice will have access to a healthcare professional who has a uh, special expertise and interest in menstrual health. So that's one way of doing it. Whether that would work in the Welsh system, I don't know, but that, that's something that could be looked at because that's in the Women's Health Plan in Scotland. And Jenny Rathbone, you had a comment to make there? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, I, I don't know whether you want to ask Debbie to go first or I'm, I'm happy to, you know, go behind. Shall I go, go ahead then? That's fine. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say that um, what Jenny says about persistence, I'm sure is true, but it really does raise the equity issue, um, which is a really, really um, significant problem, I think, uh, because, it, you know, some people, um, are confident communicators and they know how to marshal the facts, look at the tracker um, information, uh, make a note of exactly um, where, how and when they feel pain. But for a lot of people that, you know, they, they live really complicated lives. They have maybe several children, other responsibilities, and they're not particularly used to dealing with authority which is what we're dealing with here. GPs are sort of one of the gods up there, aren't they? Um, and I think that is a particular problem. Uh, I had a woman recently who had had endometriosis all her life. Um, and it was she was only diagnosed when she was 43. She, she'd had, you know, a really painful life, had managed to have two children and four uh, miscarriages. Um, and it, they, she, the just, and endometriosis was not discovered until she was opened up in order to have a hysterectomy, at which point they had to close her up again in order to then have a proper, you know, uh, a, the presence of a, of a bowel surgeon present as well. So you can see how difficult it is for people who don't have those communication skills and certainly don't have the money to, to be able to go private if they're in desperation, they can't get what they need out of the NHS. Thanks, Jenny. Debbie, did you want to come in now? That's fine, yeah. No, I was just going to say, um, again, Jenny makes some really, really 
valuable points there. Um, I think one of the things that, that we are calling for and is mentioned in the Women's and Girls Health Plan um, is that we want to see um, a diverse array of patients, an integral part of all medical training, um, including um, devising content, delivery of content and assessment. That would be the ideal. Um, and also we'd, we'd like to see endometriosis on what's called a primary care quality and improvement framework. And there are lots of different kind of diseases and health conditions part of this, this framework to improve um, what's on offer in, in primary care. And that includes data collection. Um, and you know, some of those conditions include diabetes, um, COPD, um, cardiovascular disease, all sorts of things. But interestingly, um, not one of them is um, a menstrual health or gynecological condition like endometriosis or even menopause. So, you know, that's that's something that really could be addressed, along with involving patients in, in training. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Um, there's a couple of questions here that I will have a go at answering about the um, ESHRAE guidelines and the NICE guideline. Now, just to be clear, the NICE guideline is adopted everywhere in the UK. So, and in fact, the guideline states that if you have deep endometriosis, whether that's suspected or confirmed, you should be seen in a tertiary, in a specialist centre in, in tertiary care. Obviously, this is not sometimes not happening um, due to you know capacity issues, and obviously in Wales the issue of the cross health board referrals. Um, so that is that is the the rule, so to speak, um, everywhere in the UK. Um, and I don't see that changing with any update of the guideline. Um, the guideline isn't fully implemented anywhere in the UK. Wales is not unique in that respect. Scotland is now sort of heading down that, that track with their new women's health plan. So there's scope for improvement, um, obviously, on that. And the ESHRAE guideline is one of the reasons that uh, one of the uh, reasons we're using to say why it's time to update the NICE guideline, because obviously there are recommendations now in the new European guideline that are not in a guideline done five years ago because, you know, medical science moves on, there's new research about the effectiveness of different treatments and things like that. Um, and then there was a question about the Endometriosis Cymru website, and I wondered, um, it was uh, Debbie, if you could briefly explain um, the project, but I thought it might be helpful if I share the site, then people can see it. So if people can see here. So it's a, it's a bilingual site and as you can see um, the top uh, line of it there. So do you want to explain a bit more um, about the project, Debbie, because I know that you were involved with it. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, so not just not just me involved with it, but yes. patients, <laughs> yeah, patients yeah, of course. course. Um, essentially, yes, it's um, it was part of the recommendations that emerged from the 2018 endometriosis task and finish group um, around having a Wales specific resource that would um, you know tackle some of those those issues I described at the start about patients feeling really isolated and alone with with symptoms. So um, it's been funded by the Welsh Government and the Women's Health Implementation Group, and it's been co-produced by um, Cardiff University uh, and FTWW volunteers. Um, so it's a, it's a very much a patient-centred um, resource. As I say, it's been fully co-produced. It provides lots of sort of patient testimonies and stories, and it's also got lots of what are called patient activation tools on it as well. So things that can help you, practical tools, um, including the symptom tracker, but also things around um, how to have kind of productive and empathetic conversations with friends, family, colleagues, um, in the workplace, lots and lots of information, and it's all entirely bilingual. And it's, I should say that it is a living resource. So we hope, as Jenny Shaw mentioned earlier, 
that there will be additional content added, for example, around uh, the endometriosis nurses and the services that they provide, how to access them, etc. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks. Um, let's have a look. Um, and there's a question here about the waiting times for endometriosis surgery, which as already mentioned is, is a big problem in Wales. So um, the question is, you know, we it's great that the nurses are in place, but um, you know, how is that going to help to reduce the, the wait for diagnosis and then the wait for surgery? Um, you know, what else is, um, is going on in order to address that? So um, I don't know if Jenny Shaw, you're able to answer that question. Obviously, um, it may not come exactly under your role, but you may know other things that yeah. are going on. I mean, I, I, mm, I, I did raise it in, in my presentation because it's a major, major issue. And the, um, the waiting times here in Wales are catastrophic, really. Um, and without adequate provision, I don't know how it's going to change, particularly. It's, it's a really, really difficult situation. And it comes down to the a fact that you talked about earlier about funding. So, you know, if we're not paying adequately for surgery that can take six, seven, eight hours, then it's people are not going to be able to give up that amount of time, unfortunately. And so ultimately, this one is down to the Welsh Government to sort. Jenny Rathbone, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think this is um, a political issue and I think it's one that uh, I'm very happy to address. And um, uh, absolutely, the waiting times for all procedures are unacceptably high at the moment. And the main cause of that problem is that people are staying in hospital long after they don't need to be in hospital. Uh, so they are occupying beds um, that other people could be occupying. If only we could get people who've, who've had whatever medical treatment they need um, out into the community to be nursed to back to health in the community. And this is mainly a problem of, of, of the social care sector where we need to really increase the professionalization of the sector, increase the wages. Uh, the Welsh Government is now, um, has put aside money for paying the real living wage to all social care workers, whether they're working in care homes or whether they're working in the community. Uh, but clearly it's going to take time to, to professionalise the social care sector. But that is a major cause of the problem. I think another cause of the problem is that uh, whilst the endo specialist service is on the site of our major trauma centre for the whole of Wales, it will always be vulnerable to losing its slots, its, surge, its, surge, its operation slots in theatre because if somebody appears out of the blue as an emergency who will die if they are not operated on at that moment clearly there is no argument you know they are going to take precedence over somebody who has a chronic condition and it seems to me that one of the solutions to this is to is to move the endo service up the road to Clantricent which is not a major trauma hospital anybody who is literally um, facing possible death uh, will not be taken there. They will be taken to the Heath probably by helicopter. Um, so I think that is one of the vulnerabilities of the service, uh, but it requires a culture change amongst the, the consultants because clearly it doesn't just involve the endo consultants, it involves other specialists who need to be involved in, the, in it. But I, I think there is a, a a culture change is beginning to happen, but it's a work in progress. So I completely acknowledge that there is a massive problem in all 
um, aspects of uh, people's medical care. But there's a, a really serious problem um, in endometriosis care and, and the huge backlog of really complex operations that simply weren't possible to carry out during, in the middle of a, of a COVID pandemic, where the risks of somebody getting COVID on top of having a major operation would probably would have seen them off. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Beth, you have your hand up. Would you yeah, like to come in? I just wanted to add on to the previous question that Jenny Rathbone just answered, but to say that so from the 2018 government report and now we know even more that the part of the patient pathway that seems that will make the biggest difference to patients is that specialist um, access to specialist care. And obviously we've mentioned before that one of the consultants has retired um, and hasn't been replaced. Um, the health minister has also recently said she is now determined for women to have access to the care that they need. Um, so, Jenny, do you know what her next plan is moving forward to sort of address that next sort of important issue? Because um, sort of, I don't know what autonomy she has in regards to over the, the health boards, but how sort of high up on her agenda do you know whether that is um, to kind of deliver on that next sort of critical part um, that really would help patients in Wales with endo? Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that um, Leonard Morgan has robust conversations with the senior leadership in all the health boards on a regular basis and I know she had one today and um, she's most definitely pursuing the issue of ensuring that we have that holistic uh, approach to women's health that Debbie was talking about um, and ensuring that um, that unconscious bias that exists over the approach to women, uh, not just in aspects of um, medicine that only relate to women, but in terms of cardiac uh, care, uh, which obviously men and women have cardiac problems. Um, I mean, I think there's a huge piece of work to be done on this. But I think as a first base, even raising the issue and discussing it is a, a really helpful. Um, so um, she's a very feisty lady and uh, I have faith and she plans to publish a report, uh, which is basically a policy document, which all health boards will need to um, provide their, their plans for uh, before the end of the, this summer term. Thanks for that, Jenny. Um, there's one question on here about access to pain management, and I thought Beth and Debbie might be best placed to answer it. So, you know, endometriosis can be uh, a painful chronic condition. How easy is it to get um, pain management support? I know the 2018 Welsh Government report found that it wasn't that easy to get and that some doctors were not even sure how long their patients had to wait. So I don't know what the situation is, if it's improved or anyway, Beth and Debbie, maybe um, you have some input on that. Um, I have to be honest, it's a question that I don't necessarily feel confident to answer, Rebecca. I probably could answer it, but I need a little bit of time to go away and do a bit of pondering. Fine. And, and maybe reply in writing if you're doing a kind of follow-up. We will do. Report, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. From my point of view, Rebecca, just as a personal experience of, you know, as a patient, um, I found that pain management isn't always forthcoming because it depends with the endo where it is that sometimes the pain management can um, impact the problem further. So from my point of view, I haven't, um, access sort of huge amounts of pain management because of that reason because it's likely to cause more of a problem with my symptoms than not um, and so to go down more kind of the tens machine and things like that route yeah jenny rathbone this is a political issue uh the women's health cross-party group had a, a discussion about uh pain during gynecological procedures um, at its last meeting. And um, the, the picture that was painted by um, people uh, from across Wales um, was uh, very difficult to listen to. 
um, and that there was general recognition by um, clinicians involved that this was a major problem. And I'm very pleased to see that the, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists have issued a paper, a consultation paper on pain relief and informed decision making um, in, with hysteroscopy and procedures. And it's a very good document, uh, which was just issued um, at the beginning of this month. And you can see how the, the experts are moving absolutely in the right direction, because eventually this will become mandatory in the same way that NICE guidelines are for these professionals. So I, I think this is very good news. Thank you for that. Um, and there's another one more question again about um, waiting lists. So um, someone writing a question saying that they were told um, by a specialist in the um, Cardiff and Vale Health Board that unless they were at death's door, they wouldn't get surgery. Now that may that may have been an off the cuff remark. We, you know, we 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 can't know um, it, you know exactly, but. Um, for those who are on a waiting list for several years, where is the, the help coming on that? I know that gynecology has been included in the um, initiative to uh, reinstate elective care, um, but I don't know where that's, if there are any further plans um, on that. This is maybe something we need to pass back to um, Jonathan Williams at the, at the Welsh Government. So, so Rebecca, just to say, um, again, yes, you're quite right, Jonathan will probably be best placed to answer this, but I yeah. know that um, a planned care board focused on gynaecology has very recently been set up and has had one meeting so far. So I know that it is on the agenda and it is being um, looked at as a matter of urgency. Um, but yes, as far as I know, it's still kind of a... a the early stages with only one yeah. person having taken place thus far. But, yeah. but yes, I think Welsh Government are the ones to, to answer that particular yeah. question. John, Jonathan Williams was very kind and did say if there are any questions that came up that were directed at the Welsh Government that we were not able to answer that we could pass them back to him. Um, so yes, we, we can do that. Um, okay, I think we're coming up to um, the end of the event soon. Um, so I will pass over to Jenny Rathburn, who is going to um, sum up and close the event for us. Thank you, Jenny. Well, thank you very much to everybody who's um, taken part in this event, both our speakers and also those who've um, submitted questions. Um, there's still a great deal of work to do on improving endometriosis care in Wales. And uh, I think recognizing that is really important because we need to keep pushing on ensuring that resources are put into um, providing the training to people um, in other parts of Wales um, so that those who need surgery are getting it. But most importantly, I think the advent or the arrival of our wonderful um, endometriosis specialist nurses. Uh, Liz Bruin was literally was the only <laughs> endometriosis specialist nurse for years and years, and we have to pay a huge tribute to her. Um, but I think that hopefully this will be transformational in terms of improving the time it takes um, to get diagnosis, uh, because people will be heard. We have to have a much more collaborative and participatory approach to, um, um, to, to healthcare in the NHS, uh, because listening to the patient is one of the most important things that doctors need to do. Um, so I hope that we're going to have improvements, but there is still a great deal of work to do. And there are still many, many challenges arising out of the backlog um, in surgery and other treatments that have uh, built up over COVID. Um, and which are still dogging the service, not least because one thing we can't have is people getting COVID because they've come into hospital in order to get a treatment for something else. Um, so um, I think lots of great work going on, 
but also an enormous amount of work still to do. But I think watch the space in terms of the health minister's um, new policy on uh, a holistic approach to women's health. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you to everyone for coming and thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Debbie Schaefer. Thank you to Jenny Rathbone. Thank you to Beth Hales and thank you to Jenny Shaw. And thank you for everyone for joining. I hope you found the events useful and informative and we will be following up um, to give you the information about our Update the Nice Guideline campaign. So you'll get an email tomorrow with some further information. Um, and we will pass on the question to um, the Welsh Government about the um, gynaecology backlog. Thank you, everybody.